Chapter 5 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 The Newties of Pike. Our return from Mount Tyndall to such civilization as flourishes around the Cahuilla outposts was signaled by us chiefly as to our cuisine, which offered now such bounties as the potato and once a salad in which some middle-aged lettuce became the vehicle for a hollow mockery of dressing. Two or three days, during which we dined at brief intervals, served to completely rest us and put in excellent trim for further campaigning all except Professor Brewer, upon whom a constant toothache wore painfully, my bullet mold failing even upon the third trial to extract the unruly member. It was determined we should ride together to Vizalia, seventy miles away, and the more we went, the impatienter became my friend, till we agreed to push ahead through day and night and reach the village at about sunrise in a state of reeling sleepiness quite indescribably funny. At evening, when it became time to start back for our mountain camp, my friend at last yielded consent to my project of climbing the Kern Sierras to attempt Mount Whitney. So I parted from him and, remaining at Vizalia, outfitted myself with a pack horse, two mounted men, and provisions enough for a two weeks' trip. I purposely avoid telling by what route I entered the Sierras because there lingers in my breast a desire to see once more that lovely region and failing, as I do, to confide in the people, I fear lest, if the camp I am going to describe should be recognized, I might, upon revisiting the scene, suffer harm, or even come to an untimely end. I refrain them from telling by what road I found myself entering the region of the pines one lovely twilight evening, two days after leaving Vizalia. Pines, growing closer and closer, from sentinels gathered to groups, then stately groves, and at last as the evening wore on, assembled in regular forest, through whose open tops the stars shone cheerfully. I came upon an open meadow, hearing in front the rush of a large brook, and directly reached two campfires, where were a number of persons. My two hirelings caught and unloaded the pack horse and set about their duties, looking to supper and the animals, while I prospected the two camps. That just below me, on the same side of the brook, I found to be the bivouac of a company of hunters who, in the ten minutes of my call, made free with me, hospitably offering a jug of whiskey, and then went on in their old eternal way of making bear stories out of whole cloth. I left them with the belief that my protoplasm and theirs must be different, in spite of Mr. Huxley, and passed across the brook to the other camp. Under noble groups of pines smoldered a generous heap of coals, the ruins of a mighty log. A little way from this lay a confused pile of bedclothes, partly old and half-bald buffalo robes, but in the main a thick strata of what is known to irony as comforters upon which, outstretched in a wretched awkwardness of position, was a family, all with their feet to the fire, looking as if they had been blown over in one direction or knocked down by a single bombshell. On the extremities of this common bed, with the air of having gotten as far from each other as possible, the mother and father of the Pike family reclined. Between them were two small children, a girl and a boy, and a huge girl, who, next to the old man, lay flat upon her back, her mind absorbed in the simple amusement of waving one foot, a cowhide eleven, slowly across the fire, squinting with half-shut eye, first at the vast shoe, thence at the fire, alternately hiding bright places and darting the foot quickly in the direction of any new display of heightening flame. The mother was a bony sister, in the yellow, shrunken, of sharp visage, in which were prominent two cold eyes and a positively poisonous mouth. 
her hair the color of faded hay, tangled in a jungle around her head. She rocked jerkily to and fro, removing at intervals a clay pipe from her mouth in order to pucker her thin lips up to one side and spit with precision upon a certain spot in the fire, which she seemed resolved to prevent from attaining beyond a certain faint glow. I have rarely felt more in difficulty for an overture to conversation, and was long before venturing to propose, You seem to have a pleasant camp spot here. The old woman sharply, in an almost a tone of affront, answered, They is was, and then again they is better. Does well for our hogs, inserted the old man. We've a band of pork that make out to find feed. Oh, how many have you? I asked. Nigh three thousand. Won't you set? asked Madame. Then turning, You, Susan, can't you try to set up and not spread so? Hain't you no manners, say? At this, the massive girl got herself somewhat together and made room for me, which I declined, however. Prospecting? inquired Madame. I say hunting, suggested the man. Maybe he's a cattle feller, interrupted the little girl. Going somewhere, ain't you? was Susan's guess. I gave a brief account of myself, evidently satisfying the social requirements of all but the old woman, who at once classified me as not up to her standard. Susan saw this, so did her father, and it became evident to me in ten minutes' conversation that they two were always at one and made it their business to be an antagonism to the mother. They were then allies of mine from nature, and I felt at once at home. I saw, too, that Susan, having slid back to her horizontal position when I declined to share her rightful ground, was watching with subtle solicitude that faded spot in the fire, opposing sympathy and squints accurately aligned by her shoe to the dull spot in the embers, which slowly went out into blackness before the well-directed fire of her mother's saliva. The shouts which I heard proceeding from the direction of my camp were easily translatable into summons for supper. Mr. Newty invited me to return later and be sociable, which I promised to do, and going to my camp, supped quickly and left the men with orders about picketing the animals for the night, then strolling slowly down to the camp of my friends, seated myself upon a log by the side of the old gentleman. Feeling that this somewhat formal attitude unfitted me for partaking to the fullest degree the social ease around me, and knowing that my buckskin trousers were impervious to dirt, I slid down in a reclined posture with my feet to the fire in absolute parallelism with the rest of the family. The old woman was in the exciting denouement of a coon story directed to her little boy who sat clinging to her skirt and looking in her face with absorbed curiosity. And when Johnny fired, she said, the coon fell and busted open. The little boy had misplaced his sympathies with the raccoon, and having inquired plaintively, did it hurt him? Was promptly snubbed with the reply, of course it hurt him. What do you suppose coons is made for? Then turning to me, she put what was plainly enough with her a test question. I allow you have killed your coon in your day? I saw at once that I must forever sink beneath the horizon of her standards, but failing in real experience or accurate knowledge concerning the coon, I knew no subterfuges would work with her. Instinct had taught her that I had never killed a coon, and she had asked me thus ostentatiously, to place me at once and forever before the family in my true light. No, ma'am, I said. Now you speak of it. I realize that I have never killed a coon. This was something of a staggerer to Susan and her father, yet as the mother's pleasurable dissatisfaction with me displayed itself by more and more accurate salivary shots at the fire, they rose to the occasion and began to palliate my past, Maybe, ventured Mr. Newty, that they don't have coon round the city of York. And I felt that I needed no self-defense 
when Susan firmly and defiantly suggested to her mother that perhaps I was in a better business. Driven in upon herself for some time, the old woman smoked in silence until Susan, seeing that her mother gradually quenched a larger and larger circle upon the fire, got up and stretched herself, and giving the coals a vigorous poke, swept out of sight the quenched spot, thus readily obliterating the result of her mother's precise and prolonged expectoration. Then flinging a few dry boughs upon the fire illuminated the family with the ready blaze and sat down again, leaning upon her father's knee with a faint light of triumph in her eye. I ventured a few platitudes concerning pigs, not penetrating the depths of that branch of rural science enough to betray my ignorance. Such sentiments as, a little piece of bacon well broiled for breakfast is very good, and nothing better than cold ham for lunch, were received by Susan and her father in the spirit I meant, the entire goodwill towards pork generically. I now look back in amusement at having fallen into this weakness, for the mosaic view of pork has been mine from infancy, and campaigning upon government rations has, in truth, no tendency to dim this ancient faith. By half-past nine, the gates of conversation were fairly open, and our part of the circle enjoyed itself socially, taciturnity and clouds of Virginia plug reigning supreme upon the other. The two little children crept into the comforters somewhere near the middle of the bed and subsided pleasantly to sleep. The old man at last stretched sleepily, finally yawning out, Susan, I do believe I am too tired to go out and see if them corral bars are down. I guess you'll have to go. I reckon there ain't no bears round tonight. Susan rose to her feet, stretched herself with her back to the fire, and I realized for the first time her amusing proportions. In the region of six feet, tall, square-shouldered, a firm iron back and heavy mold of limb, yet she possessed that suppleness which enabled her as she rose to throw herself into nearly all the attitudes of the Niobe children. As her yawn deepened, she waved nearly down to the ground and then, rising upon tiptoe, stretched up her clenched fist to heaven with a groan of pleasure. Turning to me, she asked, "'How would you like to go see the hogs?' The old man added, as an extra encouragement, "'Puttiest band of hogs in Tulare County. "'There's littler of the real Cicerbill nor Mexican racer stock "'than any band I've ever seen in the state. "'I driv the original outfit from Pike County to Oregon in 51 and 52.' By this time I was actually interested in them, and joining Susan, we passed out into the forest. The full moon, now high in the heavens, looked down over the whole landscape of clustered forest and open meadow with tranquil, silvery light. It whitened measurably the fine, spiry tips of the trees, fell luminous upon broad bosses of granite, which here and there rose through the soil, and glanced in trembling reflections from the rushing surface of the brook. Far in the distance, moonlit peaks towered in solemn rank against the sky. We walked silently on four or five minutes through the woods, coming at last upon a fence, which margined a wide circular opening in the wood. The bars, as her father had feared, were down. We stepped over them, quietly entered the enclosure and put them up behind us, and proceeded to the middle, threading our way among sleeping swine to where a lonely tree rose to the height of about 200 feet. Against this we placed our backs, and Susan waved her hand in pride over the two acres of tranquil pork. The eye, after accustoming itself to the darkness, took cognizance of a certain ridginess of surface which came to be recognized as the objects of Susan's pride. Quite a pretty effect was caused by the shadow of the forest which, cast obliquely downward by the moon, divided the corral into halves of light and shade. The air was filled with heavy breathing, interrupted by here and there a snore, 
and at times crescendos of tumult caused by forty or fifty pigs doing battle for some favorite bed place. I was informed that Susan did not wish me to judge of them by dark, but to see them again in the full light of day. She knew each individual pig by its physiognomy, having, as she said, growed with them. As we strolled back toward the bars, a dusky form disputed our way, Two small, sharp eyes and a wild crest of bristles were visible in the obscure light. That's old Arkansas, said Susan. He's eight year old come next June, and I could never get him to like me. I felt for my pistol, but Susan struck a vigorous attitude, ejaculating, Sue, Arkansas! She made a dash in his direction. A wild scuffle ensued, in which I heard the dull thud of Susan's shoe accompanied by, take that, dog on you, a cloud of dust, one shrill squeal, and Arkansas retreated into the darkness at a business-like trot. When quite near the bars, the mighty girl launched herself into air, alighting with her stomach across the topmost rail, where she hung a brief moment, made a violent muscular contraction, and alighted upon the ground outside, communicating to it a tremor quite perceptible from where I stood. I climbed over after her, and we sauntered under the trees back to camp. The family had disappeared. A few dry boughs, however, thrown upon the coals, blazed up and revealed their forms in the corrugated topography of the bed. I bade Susan good night, and before I could turn my back, she kicked her number 11 shoes into the air and with masterly rapidity turned in as Minerva is said to have done, in full panoply. I fled precipitously to my camp and sought my blankets, lying awake in a kind of half-reverie in which Susan and Arkansas, the old woman and her coons, were the prominent figures. Later I fell asleep and lay motionless until the distant roar of swine awoke me before sunrise next morning. Seated upon my blankets, I beheld Susan's mother drag forth the two children, one after another, by the napes of their necks, and, shaking the sleep out of them, propel them spitefully toward the brook. Then, taking her pipe from her mouth, she bent low over the sleeping form of her huge daughter, and in a high, shrill, nasal key screeched in her ear, You Sus! No sign of life on the part of the daughter. Susan! Are you going to get up? Slight muscular contraction of the lower limbs. Will you hear me, Susan? Marm, whispered the girl in a low, sleepy tone. Get up and let the hogs out. The idea had at length thrilled into Susan's brain, and with a violent suddenness she sat bolt upright, brushing her green-colored hair out of her eyes, and rubbing those valuable but bleared organs with the ponderous knuckles of her forefingers. By this time I started for the brook for my morning toilet, and the girl and I met upon opposite banks, stooping to wash our faces in the same pool. As I opened my dressing case, her lower jaw fell, revealing a row of ivory teeth rounded out by two well-developed wisdoms, which had all that dazzling grin one sees in the show windows of certain dental practitioners. It required but a moment to gather up a quart or so of water in her broad palms and rub it vigorously into a small circle upon the middle of her face, the moisture working outward to a certain high water mark, which, along her chin and cheeks, defined the limits of former ablution. Then, bearing her large red arms to the elbow, she washed her hands and stood resting them upon her hips, dripping freely and watching me with intense curiosity. When I reached the towel process, she herself twisted her body after the manner of the Belvedere torso, bent low her head, gathered up the back breadths of her petticoat, and wiped her face vigorously upon it, which had the effect of tracing concentric streaks irregularly over her countenance. I parted my hair by the aid of a small dressing glass, which so fired Susan that she crossed the stream with a mighty jump and stood in ecstasy by my side. She borrowed the glass and then my comb, rewashed her face, 
and fell to work diligently upon her hair. All this did not so limit my perception as to prevent my watching the general demeanor of the family. The old man lay back at his ease, puffing a cloud of smoke. His wife, also emitting volumes of the vapor of navy plug, squatted by the campfire, frying certain lumps of pork, and communicating an occasional spiral jerk to the coffee pot, with the purpose, apparently, of stirring the grounds. The two children had gotten upon the back of a contemplative ass, who stood by the upper side of the bed quietly munching the corner of a comforter. My friend was in no haste. She squandered much time upon the arrangement of her towy hair, and there was something like a blush of conscious satisfaction when she handed me back my looking-glass and remarked ironically, Oh, no, I guess not. No, sir. I begged her to accept the common glass, which then she did with maidenly joy. This unusual toilet had stimulated, with self-respect, Susan's every fiber, and as she sprung back across the brook and approached her mother's campfire, I could not fail to admire the magnificent turn of her shoulders and the powerful, queenly poise of her head. Her full, grand form and heavy strength reminded me of the statues of Ceres, yet there was withal a very unpleasant suggestion of fighting trim, a sort of prize-ring manner of swinging the arms and hitching of the shoulders. She suddenly spied the children upon the jackass, and with one wide sweep of her right arm projected them over the creature's head and planted her left eleven firmly in the ribs of the donkey, who bleat a precipitous retreat in the direction of the hog pens, leaving her executing a pa sewel, a kind of slow, stately jig, something between the minuet and the juba, accompanying herself by a low-hummed air and a vigorous beating of time upon her slightly lifted knee. It required my Pike County friends but ten minutes to swallow their pork and begin the labors of the day. The mountaineers' camp was not yet astir. These children of the forest were well chained in slumber, for, unless there is some special program for the day, it requires the leverage of a high sun to arouse their faculties, dormant enough by nature, and soothed into deepest quiet by whiskey. About eight o'clock they breakfasted, and by nine had engaged my innocent camp men in a game of social poker. I visited my horses and had them picketed in the best possible feed and congratulated myself that they were recruiting finely for the difficult ride before me. Susan, after a second appeal from her mother, ran over to the corral and led out the family capital, who streamed with exultant grunt through the forest, darkening the fair green meadow gardens and happily passing out of sight. When I had breakfasted, I joined Mr. Newty in his trip to the corral, where we stood together for hours, during which I had mastered the story of his years since, in 1850, he left his old home in Pike of Missouri. It was one of those histories common enough through this wide west, yet never failing to startle me with its horrible lesson of social disintegration, of human retrograde. That brave spirit of westward ho, which has been the pillar of fire and cloud leading on the weary march of progress over stretches of desert, lining the way with graves of strong men, of newborn lives, of sad, patient mothers whose pathetic longing for the new home died with them, of the thousand old and young whose last agony came to them as they marched with eyes strained on after the sunken sun, and whose shallow barrows scarcely lift over the drifting dust of the desert. That restless spirit, which has dared to uproot the old and plant the new, kindling the grand energy of California, laying foundations for a state to be that's admirable, is poetic, is to fill an immortal page in the story of America. But when, instead of urging on to wresting from the new land something better than old can give, it degenerates into mere weak-minded restlessness, killing the power of growth, the ideal of home, the faculty of repose, 
It results in that race of perpetual emigrants who roam as dreary waifs over the West, losing possessions, love of life, love of God, slowly dragging from valley to valley till they fall by the wayside, happy if some chance stranger performs for them the last rites, often less fortunate as blanched bones and fluttering rags upon too many hillsides plainly tell. The nudies were of this dreary brotherhood. In 1850, with a small family of that authentic strain of high-bred swine for which Pike County is widely known, as Mr. Nudie avers, they bade Missouri and their snug farm goodbye, and having packed their household goods into a wagon drawn by two spotted oxen, set out with the baby Susan for Oregon, where they came after a year's march, tired and cursed with a permanent discontent. There they had taken up a rancho, a quarter section of public domain, at which at the end of two years was improved to the extent of the neatest little worm fence this side of Pike, a barn, and a smokehouse. In another year, said my friend, I'd have dug for a house, but we took Ager, and the second baby died. One day there came a man who, let on that he knowed, land in California, much fairer and more worthy tillage than Oregon's best, so the poor nudies harnessed up the wagon and turned their backs upon a home nearly ready for a comfortable life and swept south with pigs and plunder. Through all the years, this story has repeated itself. New homes gotten to the edge of completion, more babies born, more graves made, more pigs, who replenished as only the Pike County variety may, till it seemed to me the mere multiplication of them must reach a sufficient dead weight to anchor the family. But this was dispelled when Nudie remarked, These year hogs is awkward about moving, and I pretty much made my mind to put them all into bacon this fall, and sell out and start for Montana. Poor fellow, at Montana he will probably find a man from Texas who, in half an hour will persuade him that happiness lies there. As we walk back to their camp, and when Dame Nudie hove in sight, my friend ventured to say, Don't you mind the old woman and her coons. She's from Arkansas. She used to say, No man could have Susan who couldn't show coonskins enough of his own killing to make a bed quilt, but she's over that mostly. In spite of this assurance, my heart fell a trifle when, the first moment of our return, she turned to her husband and asked, Do you mind what a dead open and shut on coons our little Johnny was when he was ten years old? I secretly wondered if the dead open and shut had anything to do with his untimely demise at eleven, but kept silence. Regarding her as a sad product of the disease of chronic immigration, her hard, thin nature all angles and stings, became to me one of the most depressing and pathetic spectacles. And the more, when her fever and egg boy, a mass of bilious lymph, came and sat by her, looking up with great haggard eyes as if pleading for something, he knew not what, but which I plainly saw only death could bestow. Noon brought the hour of my departure, Susan and her father talked apart a moment. Then the old man said the two would ride along with me for a few miles, as he had to go in that direction to look for new hog feed. I dispatched my two men with the pack horse, directing them to follow the trail, then saddled my kawea and waited for the newties. The old man saddled a shaggy little mountain pony for himself and for Susan strapped a sheepskin upon the back of a young and fiery mustang colt. While they were getting ready, I made my horse fast to a stake and stepped over to bid goodbye to Mrs. Nudie. I said to her in tones of deference, I have come to bid you goodbye, madam, and when I get back this way, I hope you will be kind enough to tell me one or two really first-rate coon stories. I am quite ignorant of that animal, 
having been raised in countries where they are extremely rare, and I would like to know more of what seems to be, to you, a creature of such interest. The wet gray eyes relaxed, as I fancied, a trifle of their asperity. The faint kindle seemed to light them for an instant as she asked, You never see coons catch frogs in a spring branch? No, madam, I answered. Well, I wonder. Well, take care of yourself, and when you come back this way, stop along with us, and we'll kill you a yearling, and I'll tell you about a coon that used to live under grandfather's barn. She actually offered me her hand, which I grasped and shook in a friendly manner, chilled to the very bone with its damp coldness. Mr. Nudie mounted and asked me if I was ready. Susan stood holding her prancing Mustang. To put that girl on her horse after the ordinary plan would have required the strength of Samson or the use of a stepladder, neither of which I possessed. So I waited for events to develop themselves. The girl stepped to the left side of her horse, twisted one hand in the mane, laying the other upon his haunches, and, crouching for a jump, sailed through the air, alighting upon the sheepskin. The horse reared, and Susan, twisting herself around, came right side up with her knee upon the sheepskin, shouting as she did so, I guess you don't get me off, sir. I jumped upon Kawea, and our two horses sprang forward together, Susan waving her hand to her father and crying, Come along after, old man, and to her mother, Take care of yourself, which is the Pike County for au revoir. Her Mustang tugged at the bit, and bounded wildly into the air. We reached the stream bank at full gallop, the horses clearing it at a bound, sweeping on over the green floor and under the magnificent shadow of the forest. Nuti, following us at a humble trot, slopped through the creek, and when I last looked, he had nearly reached the edge of the wood. I could but admire the unconscious excellence of Susan's riding, her firm, immovable seat, and the perfect coolness with which she held the fiery horse. This quite absorbed me for five minutes, when at last she broke the silence by the laconic inquiry, Does yearn, Buck? To which I added the reply that he had only occasionally been guilty of that indiscretion. She then informed me that the first time she had mounted the colt, he had nearly bucked her to pieces. He had jumped and jounced till she was plumb tuckered out before he had given up. Gradually reining the horses down and inducing them to walk, we rode side by side through the most magnificent forest of the Sierras, and I determined to probe Susan to see whether there were not, even in the most latent condition, some germs of the appreciation of nature. I looked from base to summit of the magnificent shafts at the green plumes which traced themselves against the sky, the exquisite fall of purple shadows and golden light upon the trunks, at the labyrinth of glowing flowers, at the sparkling whiteness of the mountain brook, and up to the clear matchless blue that vaulted over us, then turned to Susan's plain, honest face and gradually introduced the subject of trees. Ideas of lumber and utilitarian notions of fence rails were uppermost in her mind, but I briefly penetrated what proved to be only a superficial stratum of the materialistic and asked her point blank if she did not admire their stately symmetry. A strange new light gleamed in her eye as I described to her the growth and distribution of forests and the marvelous change in their character and aspects as they approached the tropics. The palm and the pine, as I worked them up to her, really filled her with delight and prompted numerous interested and intelligent queries, showing that she thoroughly comprehended my drift. In the pleasant hour of our chat, I learned a new lesson of the presence of undeveloped seed in the human mind. Mr. Nudie at last came alongside and remarked that he must stop about here. But, he added, Susan will go on with you about half a mile and come back and join me here after I've taken a look at the feed. As he rode out into the forest a little way, he called me to him 
and I was a little puzzled at what seemed to be the first traces of embarrassment I'd seen in his manner. "'You'll take care of yourself now, won't you?' he asked. I tried to convince him that I would. A slight pause. "'You'll take care of yourself, won't you?' He might rely on it, I was going to say. And then he added, that that man which gets Susan has half the hogs. Then turning promptly away, he spurred the pony, and his words as he rode into the forest were, Take good care of yourself. Susan and I rode on for half a mile until we reached the brow of a long descent, which she gave me to understand was her limit. We shook hands, and I bade her goodbye, and as I trotted off, these words fell sweetly upon my ear. Say, you'll take good care of yourself, won't you say? I took pains not to overtake my camp men, wishing to be alone. And as I rode for hour after hour, the picture of this family stood before me in all its deformity of outline, all its poverty of detail, all its darkness of future. And I believe I thought of it too gravely, to enjoy as I might the subtle light of comedy which plays about these hard, repulsive figures. In conversation, I had caught the clue of a better past. Nudie's father was a New Englander, and he spoke of him as a man of intelligence and, as I should judge, of some education. Mrs. Nudie's father had been an Arkansas judge, not perhaps the most enlightened of men, but still very far in advance of herself. The conspicuous retrograde seemed to me an example of the most hopeless phase of human life. If, as I suppose, we may all sooner or later give in our adhesion to the Darwinian view of development, does not the same law which permits such splendid scope for the better open up to us also possible gulfs of degradation? And are not these chronic immigrants whose broken-down wagons and weary faces greet you along the dusty highways of the far west, melancholy examples of beings who have forever lost the conservatism of home and the power of improvement? End of chapter 5. The Newties of Pike. Chapter 6 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Coweas Run. After trying hard to climb Mount Whitney without success, and having returned to the plains, I enjoyed my two days' rest in hot Basalia, where were fruits and people, and where at length I thawed out the last traces of alpine cold and recovered from hard work and the sinful bread of my fortnight's campaign. I considered it happiness to spend my whole day on the quiet hotel veranda, accustoming myself again to such articles as chairs and newspapers, and watching with unexpected pleasure the few village girls who flitted about during the day, and actually found time after sunset to chat with favored fellows beneath the wide oaks of the street side. Especially interesting seemed the rustic sister of whom I bought figs at a garden gate, thinking her, as I did, Camille Faux, though recollecting later that her gown was of forgotten mode, and that she carried a suggestion of ancient history in the obsolete style of her back hair. Everybody was of interest to me, not excepting the two Mexican mountaineers, who monopolized the agent at Wells Fargo and Company's office, causing me delay. They were transacting some little item of business and stood loafing by the counter, mechanically jingling huge spurs and shrugging their shoulders as they chatted in a dull, sleepy way. At the door they paused, keeping up quite lively dispute, without apparently noticing me as I drew a small bag of gold and put it in my pocket. There was no especial reason why I should remark the stolid, brutal cast of their countenances, as I thought them not worse than the average Californian greaser, but it occurred to me that one might as well guess at a geological formation 
as to attempt to judge the age of mountaineers, because they get very early in life a fixed expression, which is deepened by continual rough weathering and undisturbed accumulations of dirt. I observed them enough to see that the elder was a man of middle height, of wiry light figure and thin hawk visage, a certain angular sharpness making itself noticeable about the shoulders and arms, which tapered to small, almost refined hands. A mere fringe of perfectly straight black beard followed the curve of his chin, tangling itself at the ear with shaggy, unkempt locks of hair. He wore an ordinary stiff-brimmed Spanish sombrero, and the inevitable greasy red sash performed its rather difficult task of holding together flannel shirt and buckskin breeches, besides half-covering with folds a long, narrow knife. His companion struck me as a half-breed Indian, somewhere about eighteen years of age, his beardless face showing deep, brutal lines, and a mouth which was a mere crease between hideously heavy lips blood stained the rowels of his spurs an old felt hat crumpled and ragged slouched forward over his eyes doing its best to hide the man i thought them a hard couple and summed up their traits as stolidity and utter cruelty i was pleased that the stable man who saddled kawea was unable to answer their inquiry where i was going and annoyed when i heard the hotel keeper inform them that I started that day for Millerton. Leaving behind us people and village, Kawea bore me out into the grateful shade of oaks, among rambling settlements and fields of harvested grain, whose pale Naples yellow stubble and stacks contrasted finely with the deep foliage, and served as a pretty groundwork for stripes of vivid green, which marked the course of numberless irrigating streams low cottages overarched with boughs and hemmed in with weed jungles margined my road i saw at the gate many children who looked me out of countenance with their serious stupid stare they were the least self-conscious of any human beings i have seen trees and settlements and children were soon behind us an open plain stretching on in front without visible limit a plain, slightly browned, with the traces of dried herbaceous plants, and unrelieved by other object than distant processions of trees, traced from some canyon gate of the Sierras westward, across to the middle valley, or occasional bands of restless cattle marching solemnly about in search of food. It was not pleasant to realize that I had one hundred and twenty miles of this lonely sort of landscape ahead of me, nor that my only companion was Kawea, For with all his splendid powers and rare qualities of instinct, there was not the slightest evidence of response or affection in his behavior. Friendly toleration was the highest gift he bestowed on me, though I think he had great personal enjoyment in my habits as a writer. The only moments that we ever seemed thoroughly in rapport were when I crowded him down to a wild run, using the spur and shouting at him loudly, or when in our friendly races homeward toward camp through the forest, I put him at a leap where even he doubted his own power. At such times I could communicate ideas to him with absolute certainty. He would stop or turn or gather himself for a leap at my will, as it seemed to me, by some sort of magnetic communication but I always paid dearly for this in long, tiresome efforts to calm him. With the long level road ahead of me, I dared not attack its monotony by any unusual writing, and having settled him at our regular traveling trot, a gait of about six miles an hour, I forgot all about the dreary expanse of plain and gave myself up to quiet reverie. About dusk, we had reached the King's River Ferry. An ugly, unpainted house, perched upon the bluff and flanked by barns and outbuildings of disorderly aspect overlooked the ferry not a sign of green vegetation could be seen except certain half-dried willows standing knee-deep along the river's margin 
and that dark pine zone lifted upon the Sierras in the eastern distance. It is desperate punishment to stay through a summer at one of these plain ranches, there to be beat upon by an unrelenting sun in the midst of a scorched landscape and forced to breathe Sirocco and sand. Yet there are found plenty of people who are glad to become master of one of these ferries or stage stations, their life for the most part silent, and as unvaried as its outlook, given over wholly to permanent and vacant loafing. Supper was announced by a businesslike youth who came out upon the veranda and vigorously rung a tavern bell, although I was the only auditor and, likely enough, the only person within twenty miles. I envy my horse at such times. The graminivorous have us at a disadvantage, for one revolts at the cuisine, although disliking to insult the house by quietly shying the food out the window. I arose hungry from the table, remembering that some eminent hygienist has avowed that by doing so, one has achieved sanitary success. As I walked over to see Kawea at the corral, I glanced down the river and saw, perhaps a quarter of a mile below, two horsemen ride down upon our bank, spur their horses into the stream, swim to the other side, and struggle up a steep bank, disappearing among bunches of cottonwood trees near the river. So dangerous and unusual a proceeding could not have been to save the half-dollar ferriage. There was something about their seat and the cruel way they drove home their spurs that, in default of better reasons, made me think them Mexicans. The whole Tulare Plain is the home of nomadic ranchers who, as pasturage changes, drive about their herds of horses and cattle from range to range, and as the wolves prowl around for prey, so a class of Mexican highwaymen rob and murder them from one year's end to the other. I judged the swimmers were bent on such errand, and lay down on the ground by Kawea to guard him, rolling myself in my soldier's greatcoat, and slept with saddle for a pillow. Once or twice the animal waked me up by stamping restively, but I could perceive no cause for alarm, and slept on comfortably until a little before sunrise when I rose, took a plunge in the river, and hurriedly dressed myself for the day's ride. The ferryman, who had promised to put me across the river at dawn, was already at his post, and, after permitting Kawea to drink a deep draft, I rowed him out onto the ferry boat and was quickly at the other side. The road for two or three miles ascends the right bank of the river, approaching in places quite closely to the edge of its bluffs. I greatly enjoyed my ride, watching the Sierra skyline high and black against a golden circle of dawn, and seeing it mirrored faithfully in still reaches of river, and pleasing myself with the continually changing foreground, as group after group of tall motionless cottonwoods were passed. The willows, too, are pleasing in their entire harmony with the scene, and the air they have of protecting bank and shore from torrent and sun. The plains stretched off to my left into dusky distance, and ahead, in a bare, smooth expanse, dreary by its monotony, yet not altogether repulsive in the pearly obscurity of the morning. In midsummer these plains are as hot as the Sierra through the long blinding day, but after midnight there comes a delicious blandness upon the air, a suggestion of freshness and upspringing life, which renews vitality within you. Kawea showed the influence of this condition in the sensitive play of ears and toss of head and in his free-spirited stride. I was experimenting on his sensitiveness to sounds and had found that his ears turned back at the faintest whisper when suddenly his head rose and he looked sharply forward toward a clump of trees on the river bank 150 yards in front of us where a quick glance revealed to me a campfire and two men hurrying saddles upon their horses, a gray and a sorrel. They were Spaniards, the same who had swum King's River the afternoon before, and as it flashed on me finally, 
the two whom I had studied so attentively at Vesalia. Then at once I saw their purpose was to waylay me and made up my mind to give them a lively run. The road followed up the bank to their camp in an easterly direction, and then turning a sharp right angle to the north, led out upon the open plain, leaving the river finally. I decided to strike across, and threw Kawea into a sharp trot. I glanced at my girth, and then at the bright copper upon my pistol, and settled myself firmly in the saddle. Finding that they could not saddle quickly enough to attack me mounted, the older villain grabbed a shotgun and sprang out to head me off, his comrade meantime tightening the cinches. I turned Kawea farther off to the left and tossed him a little more rein, which he understood, and sprung out into a gallop. The robber brought his gun to his shoulder, covered me, and yelled in good English, Hold on, you! At that instant, his companion dashed up leading the other horse. In another moment, they were mounted and after me yelling, Hua! to the Mustangs, plunging in the spurs and shouting occasional volleys of oaths. By this time, I had regained the road, which lay before me, traced over the blank, objectless plain in vanishing perspective. Fifteen miles lay between me and a station. Kawea and the pistol were my only defense. Yet at that moment, I felt a thrill of pleasure, a wild moment of inspiration almost worth the danger to experience i glanced over my shoulder and found that the spaniards were crowding their horses to the fullest speed their hoofs rattling on the dry plain were accompanied by inarticulate noises like the cries of bloodhounds kawea comprehended the situation i could feel his grand legs gather underneath me and the iron muscles contract with excitement he tugged at the bit shook his bridle chains, and flung himself impatiently into the air. It flashed upon me that perhaps they had confederates concealed in some ditch far advance of me, and that the plan was to crowd me through at fullest speed, giving up the chase to new men and fresh horses, and I resolved to save Kawea to the utmost and only allow him a speed which should keep me out of gunshot. So I held him firmly and reserved my spur for the last emergency. Still we fairly flew over the plain, and I said to myself, as the clatter of hooves and din of my pursuers rang in my ears now and then, as the freshening breeze hurried it forward, that if those brutes got me, there was nothing in blood and brains, for Kawea was a prince beside their mustangs, and I ought to be worth two villains. For the first twenty minutes the road was hard and smooth and level. After that, gentle, shallow undulations began, and at last, at brief intervals, were sharp, narrow arroyos, ditches eight or nine feet wide. I reined Kawea in and brought him up sharply on their bottoms, giving him the bit to spring up on the other side. But he quickly taught me better, and gathering, took them easily, without my feeling it in his stride. The hot sun had arisen. I saw with anxiety that the tremendous speed began to tell painfully on Kawea, Foam tinged with blood fell from his mouth, and sweat rolled in streams from his whole body, and now and then he drew a deep, heaving breath. I leaned down and felt of the cinch to see if it had slipped forward, but as I had saddled him with great care, it kept its true place, so I had only to fear the greasers behind, or a new relay ahead. I was conscious of plenty of reserve speed in Kawea, whose powerful run was already distancing their fatigued mustangs. As we bounded down a roll of the plain, a cloud of dust sprung up from a ravine directly in front of me, and two black objects lifted themselves in the sand. I drew my pistol, cocked it, and whirled Kawea to the left, plunging by and clearing them by about six feet. A thrill of relief came as I saw the long white horns of Spanish cattle gleam above the dust. Unconsciously, I restrained Kawea too much, and in a moment the Spaniards were crowding down upon me at a fearful rate. On they came, the crash of their spurs and the clatter of their horses distinctly heard, and as I had so often compared the beats of chronometers, I unconsciously noted that while Kawea's, although painful, yet came with regular power, the Mustang's respiration was quick, spasmodic, and irregular. 
I compared the intervals of the two Mustangs and found that one breathed better than the other, and then upon counting the best Mustang with Kawea, found that he breathed nine breaths to Kawea's seven. In two or three minutes I tried it again, finding the relation ten to seven. Then I felt the victory, and I yelled to Kawea. The thin ears shot back flat upon his neck. Lower and lower he lay down into his run. I flung him a loose rein and gave him a friendly pat on the withers. It was a glorious burst of speed. The wind rushed by, and the plane swept under us with dizzying swiftness. I shouted again, and the thing of nervous life under me bounded on wilder and faster, till I could feel his spine thrill as with shocks from a battery. I managed to look round, a delicate matter at speed, and saw far behind the distant villains, both dismounted and one horse fallen. In an instant, I drew Kawea into a gentle trot, looking around every moment lest they should come on me unawares. In a half mile, I reached the station, and I was cautiously greeted by a man who sat by the barn door with a rifle across his knees. He had seen me come over the plain, and had also seen the Spanish horse fall. Not knowing that he might be in league with the robbers, I gave him a careful glance before dismounting, and was completely reassured by an expression of terror which had possession of his countenance. I sprung to the ground and threw off the saddle, and after a word or two with the man, who proved to be the sole occupant of this station, we fell to work together upon Kawea, my cocked pistol and his rifle lying close at hand. We sponged the creature's mouth, and, throwing a sheet over him, walked him regularly up and down for about three-quarters of an hour and then taking him upon the open plain where we could scan the horizon in all directions gave him a thorough grooming i never saw him look so magnificently as when we led him down to the creek to drink his skin was like satin and the veins of his head and neck stood out firm and round like whipcords in the excitement of taking care of Kawea, I had scarcely paid any attention to my host, but after two hours, when the horse was quietly munching his hay, I listened attentively to his story. The two Spaniards had lurked around his station during the night, guns in hand, and had made an attempt to steal a pair of stage horses from the stable, but as he had watched with his rifle, they finally rode away. By his account, I knew them to be my pursuers. They had here, however, ridden two black mustangs, and had doubtless changed their mount for the sole purpose of waylaying me. About eleven o'clock, it being my turn to watch the horizon, I saw two horsemen making a long detour round the station, disappearing finally in the direction of Millerton. By my glass, I could only make out that they were men riding in single file on a sorrel and a gray horse. But this, with the fact of the long detour, which finally brought them back into the road again, convinced me that they were my enemies. The uncomfortable probability of their raising a band and returning to make sure of my capture filled me with disagreeable foreboding. And all day long, whether my turn at sentinel duty or not, I did little else than range my eye over the valley in all directions. Twice during the day I led Kawea out and paced him to and fro for fear his tremendous exertion would cause a stiffening of the legs, but each time he followed close to my shoulder with the same firm, proud step, and I gloried in him. Shortly after dark I determined to mount and push forward to Millerton, my friend, the station man, having given me careful directions as to its position, and I knew from the topography of the country that, by abandoning the road and traveling by the stars, I could not widely miss my mark. So at about nine o'clock I saddled up Kawea, and, mounting, bade goodbye to my friend. The air was bland, the heavens cloudless and starlit. In the west a low arch of light, out of which had faded the last traces of sunset color. In the east, a silver dawn shone mild and pure above the Sierras, brightening as the light in the west faded, till at last one jetty crag was cut upon the disk of rising moon. 
upon the light gray tone of the plain every object might be seen and as i rode on the memory of danger passed away leaving me in full enjoyment of companionship with the hour and with my friend kawea whose sturdy easy stride was in itself a delight there is a charm peculiar to these soft dewless nights it seems the perfection of darkness in which you get all the rest of sleep while riding or lying wide awake on your blankets now and then an object vague and unrecognized loomed out of the dusky distance arresting our attention for kawea's quick eye usually found them first dead carcasses of starved cattle a blanched skull or a stump of aged oak were the only things seen and we gradually got accustomed to these passing with no more than a glance at last we approached a region of low rolling sand hills where kawea's tread became muffled and the silence so oppressive as to call out from me a whistle that instrument proved excellent in traviata solos but when i attempted some of chopin failed so painfully that i was glad to be diverted by arriving at the summit of the zone of hills and looking out upon the wide shallow valley of the san joaquin a plain dotted with groves and lighted here and there by open reaches of moonlit river i looked up and down searching for lights which should mark millerton i had intended to strike the river above the settlement and should now if my reckoning was correct be within half a mile of it riding down to the river bank i dismounted and allowed kawea to quench his thirst the cool mountain water fresh from the snow was delicious to him he drank stopped to breathe and drank again and again i allowed him to feed half a moment on the grass by the river bank and then remounting headed down the river and rode slowly along under the shadow of trees following a broad well-beaten trail which led as i believed to the village while in a grove of oaks jingling spurs suddenly sounded ahead and directly i heard voices i quickly turned quia from the trail and tied him a few rods off behind a thicket then crawled back into a bunch of buckeye bushes disturbing some small birds who took flight in a moment two horsemen talking spanish neared and as they passed i recognized their horses and then the men the impulse to try a shot was so strong that i got out my revolver but upon second thought put it up as they rode on into the shadow the younger as i judged by his voice broke out in a delicious melody one of those passionate spanish songs with a peculiar throbbing cadence which he emphasized by sharply ringing his spurs these californian scoundrels are invariably light-hearted crime cannot overshadow the exhilaration of outdoor life remorse and gloom are banished like clouds before this perennially sunny climate they make amusement out of killing you and regard a successful plundering time as a sort of pleasantry as the soft full tones of my bandit died in the distance i went for kawea and rode rapidly westward in the opposite direction bringing up soon in the outskirts of millerton just as the last gamblers were closing up their little games and about the time the drunk were conveying one another home kawea being stabled i went to the hotel an excellent and orderly establishment where a colored man of mild manners gave me supper and made me at home by gentle conversation promising at last to wake me early and bidding me good night at my room door with the tones of an old friend i think his soothing spirit may partly account for the genuinely profound sleep into which i quickly fell and which held me fast bound until his hand on my shoulder and half past four sir called me back and renewed the currents of consciousness after we had had our breakfast kawea and i forded the san joaquin and i at once left the road determined to follow a mountain trail which led toward mariposa the trail proved a good one to travel of smooth soft surface and pleasant in its diversity of ups and downs and with rambling curves 
which led through open regions of brown hills, whose fern and grass were ripened to a common yellow-brown, then among park-like slopes, crowned with fine oaks and occasional pine woods, the ground frequently covering itself with clumps of such shrubs as chaparral and the never-enough-admired manzanita. Yet I think I never saw such facilities for an ambuscade. I imagined the path went out of its way to thread every thicket, and the very trees grouped themselves with a view to highway robbery. I soon, though, got tired of looking out for my Spaniards, and became assured of having my ride to myself when I studied the trail and found that Cahuillas were the first tracks of the day. Riding thus in the late summer along the Sierra foothills, one is constantly impressed with the climatic peculiarities of the region. With us in the east, plant life seems to continue until it is last put out by cold. The trees appear to grow till the first frosts, but in the Sierra, foothills growth and active life culminate in June and early July, and then follow long months of warm, stormless autumn wherein the hills grow slowly browner, and the whole air seems to ripen into a fascinating repose, a rich, dreamy quiet, with distance lost behind pearly hazes, with warm, tranquil nights, dewless, silent. This period is wealthy in yellows and russets and browns, in great overhanging masses of oak, whose olive hue is warmed into umber depth, in groves of serious pines, red of bark, and cool in the dark greenness of their spires. Nature wears an aspect of patient waiting for a great change. Ripeness, existence beyond the accomplishment of the purpose of life, a long, pleasant, painless waiting for death. These are the conditions of the vegetation. And it is vegetation more than the peculiar appearance of the air, which impresses the strange character of the season. It is as if our August should grow rich and ripe through cloudless days and glorious warm nights on till February, and then wake as from sleep to break out in the bloom of May. I was delighted to ride thus alone and expose myself as one uncovers a sensitized photographic plate, to be influenced. For this is a respite from scientific work, when through months you hold yourself accountable for seeing everything, for analyzing, for instituting perpetual comparison, and as it were sharing in the administering of the physical world. No tongue can tell the relief to simply withdraw scientific observation and let nature impress you in the dear old way with all her mystery and glory, with those vague, indescribable emotions which tremble between wonder and sympathy. Behind me in distance stretched the sere plain where Kawea's run saved me. To the west, fading out into the warm blank distance, lay the great valley of San Joaquin, into which, descending by sinking curves, were rounded hills with sunny brown slopes, softened as to detail by a low clinging bank of milky air. Now and then out of the haze to the east, indistinct rosy peaks with dull silvery snow marblings stood dimly up against the sky, and higher yet a few sharp summits lifted into the clearer heights, seeming hung there floating. Quite in harmony with this, was the little group of Dutch settlements I passed, where an antique-looking man and woman sat together on a veranda, sunning their white hair and silently smoking old porcelain pipes. Nor was there any element of incongruity at the rancheria where I dismounted to rest shortly after noon. A few sleepy Indians lay on their backs, dreaming. The good-humored stout squaws nursing papooses or lying outstretched upon red blankets. The agreeable harmony was not alone from the Indian summer in their blood, but in part as well from the features of their dress and facial expression. Their clothes of Caucasian origin 
quickly fade out into utter barbarism, toning down to warm, dirty umbers, never failing to be relieved here and there by ropes of blue and white beads, or headband and girdle of scarlet cloth. I saw one woman of splendid mold soundly sleeping upon her back, a blanket covering her from the waist down in ample folds, her bare body and large full breasts kindled into bronze under streaming light, the arms flung out wide and relaxed, the lips closed with grave compression, and about the eyes and full throat an air of deep, eternal sleep. She might have been a casting in metal, but for the rich, hot color in her lips and cheeks. Toward the late afternoon, trotting down a gentle forest slope, I came in sight of a number of ranch buildings grouped about a central open space. A small stream flowed by the outbuildings and wound among chaparral-covered spurs below. Considerable crops of grain had been gathered into a corral, and a number of horses were quietly straying about. Yet with all the evidences of considerable possessions, the whole place had an air of suspicious mock sleepiness. Riding into the open square, I saw that one of the buildings was a store, and to this I rode, tying Kawea to the piazza post. I thought the whole world slumbered when I beheld the sole occupant of this country store, a red-faced man in pantaloons and shirt, who lay upon his back upon a counter fast asleep, the handle of a revolver grasped in his right hand. It seemed to me, if I were to wake him up a little too suddenly, he might misunderstand my presence and do some accidental damage, so I stepped back and poked Kawea, making him jump and clatter his hoofs, and at once the proprietor sprung to the door, looking flustered and uneasy. I asked him if he could accommodate me for the afternoon and night and take care of my horse, to which he replied in a very leisurely manner that there was a bed and something to eat and hay, and that if I was inclined to take the chances, I might stay. Being in mind to take the chances, I did stay, and my host walked out with me to the corral and showed me where to get Kawea's hay and grain. I loafed about for an hour or two, finding that a Chinese cook was the only other human being in sight, and then concluded to pump the landlord. A half hour's trial thoroughly disgusted me, and I gave it up as a bad job. I did learn, however, that he was a man of southern birth, of considerable education, which a brutal life and depraved mind had not been able to fully obliterate. He seemed to care very little for his business, which indeed was small enough, for during the time I spent there not a single customer made his appearance. The stock of goods I observed on examination to be chiefly firearms, every manner of gambling apparatus and liquors. The few pieces of stuffs, barrels, and boxes of groceries appeared to be disposed rather as ornaments than for actual sale. From each of the man's trousers pockets protruded the handle of a derringer, and behind his counter were arranged in convenient position two or three double-barreled shotguns. I remarked to him that he seemed to have a handily arranged arsenal, at which he regarded me with a cool, quiet stare, polished the handle of one of his derringers upon his trousers, examined the percussion cap with great deliberation, and then with a nod of the head intended to convey great force, said, You don't live in these parts, a fact for which I felt not unthankful. The man drank brandy freely and often, and in intervals of about half an hour called to his side a plethoric old cat named Gospel, stroked her with nervous rapidity, swearing at the same time in so distrait and unconscious a manner that he seemed mechanically talking to himself. Whoever has traveled on the West Coast has not failed to notice the fearful volleys of oaths which the oxen drivers hurl at their teams, but for ingenious flights of fancy profanity I have never met the equal of my host. With the most perfect good nature, and in unmoved continuance, he uttered florid blasphemies, which I think must have taken hours to invent. 
I was glad when bedtime came to be relieved of his presence, and especially pleased when he took me to the little separate building in which was a narrow single bed. Next this building on the left was the cook house and dining room, and upon the right lay his own sleeping apartment. Directly across the square, and not more than sixty feet off, was the gate of the corral, which creaked on its rusty hinges when moved in the most dismal manner. As I lay upon my bed, I could hear Kawea occasionally stamp, the snoring of the Chinaman on one side, and the low mumbled conversation of my host and his Indian woman on the other. I felt no inclination to sleep, but lay there in half doze, quite conscious, yet withdrawn from the present. I think it must have been about eleven o'clock when I heard the clatter of a couple of horsemen who galloped up to my host's building and sprang to the ground, their Spanish spurs ringing on the stone. I sat up in bed, grasped my pistol, and listened. The peach tree next my window rustled. The horses moved about so restlessly that I heard but little of the conversation, but that little I found of personal interest to myself. I give as nearly as I can remember the fragments of dialogue between my host and the man whom I recognized as the older of my two robbers. When did he come? Well, the sun might have been about four hours. His horse give out. I failed to hear the answer, but was tempted to shout out, No! Gray coat, buckskin breeches, which was my dress. Going to Mariposa at seven in the morning. I guess I wouldn't round here. A low, muttered soliloquy in Spanish wound up with a growl. No, and tone, not within a half mile of the place. Stab when. Out of the compressed jumble of the final sentence, I got but the one word, buckshot. The Spaniards mounted, and the sound of their spurs and horses' hooves soon died away in the north, and I lay for half an hour revolving all sorts of plans. The safest course seemed to be to slip out in the darkness and fly on foot to the mountains, abandoning my good Kawea. But I thought of his noble run and it seemed to me so wrong to turn my back on him that I resolved to unite our fate. I rose cautiously, and holding my watch up to the moon, found that twelve o'clock had just passed. Then taking from my pocket a five-dollar gold piece, I laid it upon the stand by my bed, and in my stocking feet, with my clothes in my hands, started noiselessly for the corral. A fierce bulldog, who had shown no disposition to make friends with me, bounded from the open door of the proprietor to my side. Instead of tearing me, as I had expected, he licked my hands and fawned about my feet. Reaching the corral gate, I dreaded opening it at once, remembering the rusty hinges. So I hung my clothes over an upper bar of the fence, and cautiously lifting the latch, began to push back the gate inch by inch, an operation which required me eight or ten minutes. Then I walked up to Kawea and patted him. His manger was empty. He had picked up the last kernel of barley. The creature's manner was full of curiosity, as if he'd never been approached in the night before. Suppressing his ordinary whinnying, he preserved a motionless, statue-like silence. I was in terror, lest by a neigh, or some nervous movement, he should waken the sleeping proprietor and expose my plan. The corral and the open square were half covered with loose stones, and when I thought of the clatter of Kawea's shoes, I experienced a feeling of trouble, and again meditated running off on foot, until the idea struck me of muffling the iron feet. Ordinarily, Kawea would not allow me to lift his forefeet at all. The two blacksmiths who shod him had done so at the peril of their lives, and whenever I had attempted to pick up his hind feet, he had worn me away by dangerous stamps. So I approached him very timidly, and was surprised to find that he allowed me to lift all four of his feet without the slightest objection. As I stooped down, he nosed me over and nibbled playfully at my hat. In constant dread lest he should make some noise, 
I hurried to muffle his forefeet with my trousers and shirt, and then with rather more care to tie upon his hind feet my coat and drawers. Knowing nothing of the country ahead of me, and fearing that I might again have to run for it, I determined at all cost to water him. Groping about the corral and barn, and at last finding a bucket, and ascending through the darkness to the stream, I brought him a full draft, which he swallowed eagerly. I tied my shoes on the saddle pommel, and led the horse slowly out of the corral gate, holding him firmly by the bit, and feeling his nervous breath pour out upon my hand. When we had walked perhaps a quarter of a mile, I stopped and listened. All was quiet, the landscape lying bright and distinct in full moonlight. I unbound the wrappings, shook from them as much dust as possible, dressed myself, and then mounting, started northward on the Mariposa Trail with a cocked pistol. In the soft dust, we traveled noiselessly for a mile or so, passing from open country into groves of oak and thickets of chaparral. Without warning, I suddenly came upon a smoldering fire close by the trail, and in the shadow descried two sleeping forms, one stretched on his back, snoring heavily, the other lying upon his face, pillowing his head upon folded arms. I held my pistol, aimed at one of the wretches, and rode by without wakening them, guiding Kawea in the thickest dust. It keyed me up to a high pitch. I turned completely around in the saddle, leaving Kawea to follow the trail, and kept my eyes riveted on the sleeping forms until they were lost in distance, and then I felt safe. We galloped over many miles of trail, enjoying a sunrise, and at last came to Mariposa, where I deposited my gold, and then went to bed and made up my lost sleep. End of chapter 6. Kawea's Run